Hello and welcome back to theCUBE's coverage here at RSAC, here in San Francisco. We are joined today on what we are starting to call CISO Day um, by Sam Curry, who's the CISO for Zscaler. Welcome, Sam, Hi, we're so thanks. glad to have you. Thanks, welcome back to theCUBE, man. This is unbelievable. Yeah. The very first CUBE we ever did. Was it the first? Yes, May of 2020, 2020 20, sorry, May of 2010. Yeah. And we called 14 it. 14 years ago. The, it was in Boston at EMC World, we called it the Chowda. The chowder. Cube, chowder and lobster. Yeah. And you haven't aged a day. I haven't, it's, it's unnatural, <laughs> but there you go, there you have it. Yeah. You know, some people just have it all going on. So, oh my gosh, amazing event. Um, we have shared so many different thoughts and insights over the course of the last three days. Sure. Tell me though, tell us what your, kind of what's your key vibe that you're getting from the show? Well, um, key vibe, I, I think, uh, you almost can't move without people talking about artificial intelligence these days. Um, the, I think the, the threat vectors so far are the same we've seen for a long time, but what we're seeing is an improvement in efficiency and effectiveness. And I think the, the undertones are that the toolkit's getting better on offense, faster than it is on defense. That's been true for a long time, but it seems to take a sharp turn and is accelerating. And, uh, and people seem to be waiting for the shoe to fall, is how I'd put it. A lot of talk about what's happening in the wider world uh, geopolitically, that's happening. Um, we just put out a, a threat research report, for instance, yep. through Threat Labs. Um, and uh, phishing is up again, it's yep. up 58.2, nearly 68, nearly 60%. Um, a lot of vishing, a lot of, uh, of course, the, the deep fakes, that sort of thing. So, yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a buzzing show. I actually thought maybe the attendance would go down, but I'm hearing rumors it went up, so I don't know what the official reports are yet. You know, I think Dave and I talked about this yesterday. I think maybe you mentioned you heard about 45,000, and then last night I heard somebody yeah. saying maybe 60, so 60 I don't know that we really know, we're kind of guessing. I've been to all but four of these conferences, and it's history and that would be amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's bigger this year than it was last year. Yeah. I think last year was 40 to 45. Yeah. So I think I heard 42 was some official. Yeah, market. something like that. But I don't so represent the conference now. I think I'm thinking when we first met, the world was a lot different. We were just coming Wasn't out it? of a, a, a financial crisis. Yeah. We were starting a a decade-long tech boom, boom. Yeah. with zero interest rates. Yep. Um, Cloud wasn't really a thing. We were just starting know. to talk about it in private cloud. Was yes. what was on people's minds at the time, yeah. yeah. Cloud meets big data. That's right, big Remember data, that? yeah. <laughs> was, I think we actually talked about, how do you know it's big data? It was when you could create PII, it was something we talked about. Yeah, yeah, right. It's all coming back to me now. So, Flashbacks. So much has changed. Yeah. The, obviously the, the threat surface has grown, I don't know by how much, it's mm -hmm. 2x, 3x, 10x. Um, how do you, being a practitioner in yeah. this world for so many years, how, how do you, put us, take us inside the CISO's head yeah. from 10, 20 years ago, fast forward to today, what's, what's it well, like? Well, two big things have changed. I think the first is uh, ransomware. Uh, we really can't ignore that. Uh, it, it's, it was on everyone's lips for a long time and it's not gone away. Uh, making too much money for the bad guys and I think we had a bit of a hiatus due to war uh, there was a polarization of the cyber you know, criminal community around the Ukraine and Russia for a while, but uh, it, they just keep getting more effective at it. Um, automation seems to be the name of the game, and now the application of, of Gen AI in particular. The other thing is regulatory uh, pressure, and that's not changing. So Europe, we've seen NIST 2 and DORA now coming out. Uh, we've seen GDPR influence other privacy regulations. We've seen the SEC in 2023 take some new steps, uh, and uh, everyone sort of Where's this headed? And of course, the Biden administration has brought out guidance for safety around AI, and now guidance around, and trying to use liability in order to change incentives for corporations. That happened just yesterday. Uh, we'll see where that actually plays out. But what do you every, think about that? Well, you know, I think I think we have to start changing to some degree how companies think about it. But I think it's a delicate game we have to play, and I don't know how other nations and other jurisdictions will respond to this. Uh, we don't want to ban at the wounded, right? What we want to do is make sure, and I think they've been very cautious to say it's not about liability per se, so much as getting this on the corporate agenda. And uh, I think the biggest problem in cyber is that we don't have alignment between cybersecurity and business, and even when it exists, it tends to drift apart. Yes. And that has to be fixed. It's not just in response to regulation. Um, there seems to be a misapprehension that you can have such a thing as perfect, you know, fault-free cybersecurity, and you can't. 
The question is, are you doing the right things? And what does that mean in a world that's evolving very, very quickly? And that is going to change dramatically in the next few years as well. So it's, it, there is no sort of, uh, sort of um, uh, safety standards or even practice standards like you'd have in the medical industry at this point, but we start to have to start having that dialogue. It's, acad it's academia, it's private sector, it's public sector, and I think leadership is what's needed, and we're starting to see that. You have, um, you mentioned geopolitical talk mm -hmm. here. We got two prominently in the news hot wars. Yeah. One in Ukraine, one in, one in Israel, Israel and, and Gaza. What do, what do we take away from a cybersecurity standpoint? Ukraine, you know, we didn't have Starlink mm -mm. back in 2010. Uh, but what are we learning about s cyber and war? Well, uh, you also can't ignore elections, and yes. something like half of the world is electing its government right now, this mm. year. Um, misinformation, disinformation is uh, not just an American uh, challenge with our elections here in the United States, it's everywhere. So I think we need to realize that we have authenticity, I think, is a word we need to add more to our discussion. We've always talked about CIA, right? Confidentiality, integrity, availability. I think non-repudiation was added to that list in a banking scenario, but authenticity is super, super important. Do we test it enough? Do we understand it? Um, and is it something that we're considering in our information security strategies generally? Now we get that in war, and it is uh, both cyber is both a plane for war and it's a dimension of classical warfare. Uh, we need to remember that in a cyber terrorism context. We need to remember it in a nation state context. And I think we also need to remember that in a preserving democracy and freedom context. So th this is non-trivial stuff, right? It is world so, changing. Yeah. 2016 was kind of like the weaponization of social media. We're like, wow, uh -huh. okay. And then, and then 2020 built on that with fake news in a yep. big way. And 2024 is going to bring... We deep, haven't yet seen. Deep fakes is so going to be... Deep fakes are here. That was yeah. part of our fishing report as well. We saw um, fishing uh, rise up, but deep fakes we've already seen in many regards. Uh, New Hampshire had an election where people were told not to go to the polls by a deep fake through robo-dialing by, by supposedly Joe Biden, um, at least the Democrats were, uh, for, for primaries and things like that. That's going to become much more commonplace, right? And so how do we validate these things? It's getting harder and harder to do. It's getting cheaper to execute these attacks. And so what we're also seeing at the same time, we mentioned the two hot wars, is the nature of warfare with things like drones is changing. And now we're talking about unmanned warfare, right? Or unpersoned, right? When, the, when drones go to war with one another, be they on air, land, or sea, or space. space. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, so what's the cyber dimension there? Um, and even self-replicating drones. So we really do need to come up with new norms for several new battle spaces and how they interact with each other. And then we can back up and say, so what is the role of corporations here? Uh, companies shouldn't have to face off, and individuals shouldn't have to face off with nation states. So where do we draw the lines and what are the new standards and how do we come up with a new world order around this? And, and it's and, non-trivial. And the physical security and digital security used to largely be kind of separate topics and, For the and most they're, part, they're, yeah. they're yeah. clearly smashing together. And you talk about, you know, you think about like low cost drones. Yeah. Inside, you know, the, the country. And um, low cost energy for them so they have long range and what yeah. And then the, 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 the exposure to critical infrastructure. Yep. So, how are you thinking about critical infrastructure, you know, a scale of one to 10, you know, we're not a 10 in terms of being ready. Um, definitely closer to one than we are 10. <laughs> Sounds like you have an opinion on that. I do. <laughs> I, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong. No, um, uh, and, and I, think, I think it varies by critical infrastructure because it's not all the same. By some industry, are, by, by. Yeah, some of, some of it's health, right? What happens when hospitals go down or water's not available, yeah. or food's not available is not quite the same, although it might be just as important in a different way as say banking, right? Uh, or mining, those sorts of things. So you got to look at the sectors and say, well, what is the risk profile and what is the, you know, what are we going to do to maintain things? And what are our emergency responses and how do we test that? Uh, we also have the ability to game a lot of this stuff out. Just as we do in companies, we can do this at national and international scale and how do we work with our allies? Um, for instance, in the United States, uh, our electric grid isn't just us, it's also Canada, it's also Mexico, right? Same thing is true of other forms of energy supplies. So this is, uh, this is more than just one or two parties. You know, I was looking at uh, some data from your report and one of the things that you mentioned is the manufacturing industry, no surprise, mm -hmm. is experiencing a considerable uptick, 31% yeah. in phishing attacks. 
Um, you know, and, and then we go to supply chain mm. and the dangers of supply chain. And so we've got, you know, the threat to critical infrastructure, but we've also, I mean, manufacturing plays a significant role in our ability to survive. <laughs> yeah, and, and of course we have uh, additive and now synthetic yeah. manufacturing and, and new advanced technologies coming. We often have focused on things like quantum computing or, uh, or cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, sure. that sort of thing. But there's actually a whole bunch of concurrent advancements that are going through, let's call it sharp accelerations, right? Yeah. Um, there's something called the law of accelerated returns. So what's next in AI? That's important. And what's happening in quantum? That's important. But what's happening in manufacturing? That's important. Yeah. How do we make sure that in an emergency we can manufacture the things we need, that we have redundancy in the supply chain? But then you get to, I think, the security of the supply chain. And Hey, let, let's not forget, Stuxnet was a supply chain issue, yeah. right? Maybe not for us, right? But SCADA, ICS systems, what do those segments look like? How are they accessed? Because a lot of the systems in our manufacturing and our factories, uh, they were never designed to be connected, right? right? And so, uh, how can they be turned against us or used in ways we don't expect? That's right. a very big deal. And they, can they be bricked? I mean, um, my, one of my big concerns is um, if you look at the way that artificial intelligence was used in a classic gaming sense, in chess and board games like that, uh, new strategies have been found that the grand masters of the game never expected. Right? I heard Gary Kasparov speak on it with respect to chess. The strategies that AI comes up with are not what we expect. And if you flip over now to cyber, the attack surface is too large. Right, yeah. so we've got to start thinking of how do we remove options for AI to find attack vectors we never suspected. The game of Go. Yeah, go, which, absolutely. Which is a you know, human creativity game, and then the machine actually comes up with things that humans never thought of. Deep Mind, <laughs> Deep Mind found 59 new openings that Gary Masters went, this feels like aliens. There's a, an article in The Atlantic about that. Yeah. And uh, we still don't know how to respond to those moves. So Kasparov was on theCUBE. Um, oh. I interviewed him, it was awesome. He's amazing. It, it was like a, an IBM event or something, and so we were chatting. It was interesting because at the time, this is maybe 2017, somewhere around there, when he lost to uh, the oh, he machine. Was, he was horrified, yeah. yeah it, it, right, but, because he's so competitive, he actually created, you, you probably know about this, the, a contest where the, the humans used the machines, and so, what he found was the human in a machine could yep. beat the machine. Now I'm wondering. He actually said for a decade, the best games were machine, uh, human-assisted uh, yes. machines. I mean, Machine-assisted humans, yeah. And so, yeah. I, so I, I took, I mean, I took the optimistic view of that and said, hey, this AI, it's still going to be humans and machines are going to be the best combination. That's where we are now. Yeah. So now, though, with all this AGI talk, I'm thinking, mm, maybe that's not going to last so much. Uh, the question, it's a much more complex field, perhaps, than chess, but it's anyone's guess how long it'll last for. He actually said it lasted 10 years in chess, after which the machines just owned it. And I, we're, whatever that stretch is, we're at the beginning of it now. Now, if it lasts a year, 10 years, 20 years, who knows? But at some point, the machines will be good enough to be fighting each other, and we'll have to set the strategy up, and then they'll fight it in real time, and we won't have much say in the matter. So but at the moment, machines it's that. fighting machines. But at the moment, it's, it's, it's machines versus humans. humans. Yeah. But, it, but it will be, in your, in your crystal ball, Take smarter. Take a of salt. Smart, yeah, <laughs> we all. The future, what they said, forecasting the future. Yeah. You know, forecasting is hard, especially if it's about the future. Um, <laughs> Smarter machines attacking less smart machines, and then more smart. Or maybe machines. not even less smart. Just it's all about prep, right? It's about how well the machines have prepped. You can game out millions of scenarios, and how well have you built your strategy? It's not necessarily which one has the higher IQ. It's which one has more thoughtfully planned its games, right? And found it. Okay, so Amazon turned the data center into an API, mm -hmm. and then ChatGPT showed us the way to turn technology into a natural language interface. What is that, how does that change how you think about securing AI? Well, um, that's a huge question because there's authenticity, the information we feed to it, and I think there's a lot we could be doing around things like um, AI, honey AI, just like we had honey pots, right, honey nets. Yes, right. Um, mm -hmm. how, how do we make sure that poison, we understand how these things are being poisoned or set up? Um, that we understand the biases and in the ingestion of information in the models themselves and the outputs that come out. Um, it, for justice, sure, but also because the output actually affects business. 
Um, is somebody subtly influencing outcomes and then using it for manipulation of, of performance and results? That's, that's a big deal. Mm. Yeah. Um, every company should be really thinking hard about where do they want it to apply. And I make a distinction right now between deductive AI applications, that is for a function, as in coming down to a cog in a machine. Are you using this for finding malware? Are you using it for anti-fraud? Are you using it for risk determination? Because you can wrap terms around that versus the pulsating brain induction. Right, is it I have the brain that can do everything. Well, I'm not interested in that right now, by the way. That, save that for the phase where it's machine versus machine and I need it to be thinking about strategy as well. Right now, that's the harder thing to wrap your head around. So think about data leakage, uh, about uh, control of the flow of information, understanding it. Every company is going to have to, uh, going to, have to embrace to some degree artificial intelligence and its tools. The question is how they go about doing so and how they go about governing it. But you're, if I understand it correctly, Sam, you're saying it's really use case specific in terms yep. of how you defend today. And classifying those. Classifying those and in the future when it's the everything AI. We better a, do it because they're doing it now. Game. We're yeah. actually seeing changes in efficiency and effectiveness. They haven't yet done the go and the chess thing of finding entirely new attack vectors. But when that happens, they will go on vectors uh, no pun intended, for which there are no responses. In Go, there's something called Joseki, which is you get an attack and there's a planned sequence almost that you are expected to follow to minimize loss. We don't know what those are for the new openings, and they may not be any. So we need to minimize the attack surface. It's a new application of zero trust, or least trust. Yeah. Let's start doing that now in our architecture. My heart rate just went up. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. Well, I think every, I think, Wasn't meant to scare you. I think everybody's heart rate is up, though. And you know, so final question for you yeah. here is that, you know, what I think about when we talk about all of these challenges that we need to get arms around, and I think about the urgency of some of that. Again, we've got these wars happening. We've got elections mm. happening in a very short period of time. Um, some happening now, but so where? What's your best advice to a CISO? In you know, I mean. I mean, because you get so crazy with, you know, worry about all the things I need to see to, where do we start if you're a CISO? I, I usually tell people, uh, don't panic. Right? Uh, it's not just a Douglas Adams reference. Uh, yeah. uh, and I usually say, usually, for the most part, unless you're in critical infrastructure, people aren't going to die. That's the good news. And uh, you've got to get out of the fight or flight response of practice. Yeah. Uh, but at that point, um, the most important thing is to be thoughtful and to respond to what really happens. It may be happening faster, but it's still not instant. And it's still an economic game for the most part in terms of resources and investment. Nation states may see, have what seems like infinite budgets, but they still are part of an ecosystem where tools take time to build. Yeah. And uh, actually carrying out attacks it is an investment of resources and there's risk in attack. And so our job is not to have perfect security, small improvements in risk, reduction of likelihood, making things less visible, uh, reducing the blast radius. Uh, so that, that has massive returns in terms of, of, of actually reducing risk and loss. And that's a game we can play and we can win at. Now, on the other hand, if you're just incrementally changing your strategy by 10% every year, that's good luck with that. <laughs> it, you, might have, you might have a bit more cheese to move for you and your organization, and that's cultural change, inertia, if you will, and that's the hardest thing to do. Yeah. Well, Sam Curry, Zscaler CISO, thank you so much for thank joining us me. here at, at RSA and to our viewing audience. Thanks for hanging with theCUBE. And we will see you back here for more live coverage from RSA in San Francisco for the rest of the day.